This episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my review of the entire Land Before Time film series. In the last part, we covered entries one through four, with one being the best, really good one so far. Pretty good additions with two and three, keeping the momentum, and the first bad movie in my opinion with four. Even though we've hit a dud, I'm still surprised at how well these animations hold up, still being enjoyable all these years later. In this video, I'll be returning to numbers 5 through 8. I wanted to cover 9 here, but the script is already overinflated. Even though this series has seemingly been drawn out and overextended at this point, we're still getting super iconic entries, scenes, and characters that have stuck with us through the ages, so let's get into it. Let's dig this up. For all the disappointment brought about by Journey Through the Mists, it's more than made up for in The Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island, with the series now at the helm of director Charles Grosvenor. Whenever I think of the series, this is the first movie that comes to mind. The Mysterious Island, in my opinion, is the quintessential, pure essence of a Land Before Time film. Our leads go on an exciting adventure that's not stuck in a boring cave, we're treated to several exciting action sequences, the conflict here feels natural and well played, and all around we get the best collection of songs. So what's this true American classic about? Well, life in the Great Valley is all well and good as usual, until a swarm of locusts descend to eradicate all greenery. Hey look, a dinosaur movie with locusts that isn't terrible. Wow. What do you know? In order to find food, all the dinosaurs leave the valley, but discover a whole lot of nothing, causing Mr. Threehorn to go on his most bigoted rant yet. Everyone knows how stupid duckbills are. Now that's a lot of damage! This poor fool probably wandered in circles for days. <laughs> Man, this dude is crazy. He just eradicated Ducky's entire race. The herd starts arguing over where to look for food, threatening to break up and separate the friend group, so they head off on their own quest for vegetation, bringing them to the island. Here they run into their old friend Chopper, who's grown since we last saw him. Some shenanigans occur with the kids worrying about his parents eating them, and then we're treated to a fight between them and a new challenger approaching, the Giganotosaurus. Once the new threat is dealt with, everyone is delivered back to shore by a weirdly flirtatious Elasmosaurus. There, they reunite with their parents who found a lush grove to inhabit until the Great Valley grows green again. So, I had a lot of fun with this adventure. We never get a dull moment. The vast majority of scenes are fun and super memorable, so even as a 24 year old, I'm glued to the screen. Some of these sequences are legitimately intense. Like this one part where they attempt to raft back to the mainland on a log only for a Cretoxyrhina shark to appear. Our protagonists are stranded out in the water, nearly helpless. It's a great scene. The Land Before Time 5, the true successor to Jaws, not gonna lie. While the Giganotosaurus doesn't get as much screen time as I remember, it's still a welcome addition to the roster, being one of the main antagonists apart from the Rex parents. I gotta commend the filmmakers for giving an actually decent portrayal of this creature as opposed to lots of other media out there. It isn't this giant, monstrous killing machine. Sure, it's about as bloodthirsty as all the other unnamed sharp toots, but is about equal to the Rexes. Some skill in combat keeps it alive for a bit against them, but ultimately fails hard as it's smacked off the cliffside into the big, 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 big water. Probably drowning off screen. Dang, why is death not allowed to be shown in these? They're dinosaurs. The most famous thing they do is die. Anyways, yeah, it gives an exciting chase, gets an epic fight. I really like this villain, even if its role is somewhat short-lived. Then there's a natural tension whenever Chomper's around because he's a sharp tooth. He's probably eaten dozens of three horns, long necks, and spike tails by this point. It's a very natural point of contention. All that's stopping Chomper from having a buffet here is his fondness for the main cast. On top of that, Chomper must hide his friends from his parents at all costs. The drama writes itself. Is it a repeat of Great Valley Adventure? A bit, but he's grown and more self-aware. There's more of a conscious decision as to whether he wants a big lunch or not. 
Chomper's always been a favorite character of mine, for good reason. He's a valuable, unlikely ally that gives us much more insight into the Sharp Toots, who have often been flat and kinda bland. Because of him, we know they're sophisticated enough to speak their own language and herbivore English, they can have loving families, and will form bonds with even potential prey items. Chomper may be one of my favorites, but even he is outclassed by a certain someone who will be arriving shortly. So, I've been bringing up the songs for each installment, aside from the original of course. We've heard some complete classics before, and trust me, some are still to come, but arguably 5 has the best overall set of songs in the series. Each of the three editions are fantastic and need to be in any conversation regarding this franchise. Big Water, catchy as all heck. Friends for Dinner, a stroke of comedic genius, and Always There. Oh god have mercy, Always There is the biggest emotional gut punch since Littlefoot's Shadow. In this song, while isolated from their herd, the main characters sing about how they miss their parents and the love they were always shown, how their parents have always been there to protect them. Now they're trapped on an island with no hope of seeing them again. It's enough to make a grown man cry. The real slap in the face comes with Littlefoot. We have Ducky singing about her mom, Sarah singing about her dad. You expect Littlefoot to sing about his grandparents, but no. This dude starts singing about his freaking dead mother. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! Not fair, movie. That was a low blow. Up to this point, Littlefoot hasn't mentioned his mom at all since the original. That's probably not something he'd want to bring up in day-to-day -day life but it all finally comes out in this one beautiful song. The emotional damage won't even stop there. During the film's resolution, when everyone reunites with their families, an orchestral version of the song plays just to hurt us one last time. Who? Who did this to us? Hmm, Michael Tavera? Not fair, bro. Not fair. Overall, The Mysterious Island is a shining example of what these movies should be. It's an endlessly fun adventure with good characters that's willing to tug at the heartstrings, giving lots of credit to its audience to handle a more mature subject matter. This isn't simply good for the land before time, no, this is a legitimately great movie. Some feathers may be ruffled, but this is my favorite installment so far, stealing the long-held top spot from the original. What a comeback. Moving on to the sixth installment, Secret of Soros Rock, my reaction on rewatches is similar to number three in that there's just not that much for me to say. I'm not all that intrigued by it one way or another. Overall, the experience is a forgettable one, though some aspects do stick out. Of course, this one's most notable for its inclusion of a new character, this diplodocus named Doc. He's pulled straight out of a western, this stern, tough, no-nonsense, few-words fellow who's incredibly skilled with his weapon. Rather than a revolver, Doc whips his tail around. The cherry on top is a performance by country music star Chris Christopherson. Basically, we're watching Clint Eastwood as a dinosaur, and it's beautiful. At some point, I was even expecting to hear a... That would have been so on the nose, but so goofy and over the top, I kinda wish they went for it. Yeah, he's a cool character, but the plot is really set into motion by the other new additions, Sarah's niece and nephew, Dinah and Dana. Wait, so Sarah has siblings? How come we never really see them or they're never mentioned? Mr. Threehorn only mentioned Sarah. Did his wife just take the other kids? Over the course of the film, Sarah has to watch over these two baby trikes who goof around all the time and speak in high-pitched nonsense. Being more of a plot device than actual characters, they don't get enough screen time to be annoying. There's a win, I guess. So far, at least, we haven't had a Jar Jar Binks of the series who notoriously sinks a movie with bad attempts at comedy. I was also watching Treasure Planet for the first time the other day, and man, as much as I loved it, one annoying character two-thirds in almost ruined it. Anyways, so Secret of Source Rock is about Source Rock, this mysterious tower outside the Great Valley that resembles a long neck. 
We start out with Littlefoot's grandpa telling the legend of the Lone Dinosaur, a heroic sauropod who beats up sharp toots to save the day. In honor of his awesomeness, an Earthshake creates this giant monument seen from the Great Valley. The rocks even depict a ring of teeth around its neck, symbolizing the defeated sharp tooths. Legend has it that if anyone damages Source Rock, bad luck will descend on them. Coincidentally, after hearing this story, the lone wandering Doc shows up with Littlefoot convinced that he's the lone dinosaur. Saving the kid's life, Littlefoot becomes awed by the man, the myth, the legend. While discussing this with others, Dinah and Dana decide to run off the source rock, being absolute units as they skip past obstacles that would demolish the other kids. Of course, it had to happen that source rock is damaged due to their fooling around, but they're saved by our main characters right before dying. So yeah, Source Rock is damaged, everyone experiences bad luck, we get a standout scene where a tornado descends upon the valley, and Littlefoot goes off to fix everything by placing the tooth of a dead Allosaurus on the monument as tribute, I guess. Oh, yeah, there was an Allosaurus, one so incompetent it couldn't kill two hatchlings or eat a juvenile already in its mouth. Lion of the Jurassic my butt. But the aloe isn't actually dead, it awakens to attack Littlefoot on his way to the rock, until his grandpa comes to the rescue. But it doesn't end there, a random T-Rex comes along to inexplicably team up with the Allosaurus to bring down a Brontosaurus buffet. When all hope is lost, Doc arrives to help out Grandpa Longneck and the two emerge victorious. The kids make it to Source Rock, and the bad luck, and live happily ever after, though Doc moves on. I... I don't know. The story here isn't bad. I'm not offended in any way. There are no egregious errors that make me want to jump off a cliff. It just seems like a little beneath the mainline film in the series. The kids get bad luck? Really? Number 6 feels like an extended episode of a show rather than a full movie. Maybe I would have liked it if more focus was placed on Doc and some adventure concerning him, rather than leaving him on the back burner for much of the runtime. If there is another shining compliment to give, there is a heartfelt message about heroes. Littlefoot obsesses over this potential lone dinosaur, who's nice enough. The life Doc lives is cool and glamorized, we love stories of rough and tumble heroes, but an even better role model is the grandpa who gives everything to raise and protect his grandson. By the end of the film, Littlefoot learns to appreciate the people he has in his life rather than idolizing strangers. The children even rework the Lone Dinosaur Camp story into one about the brave Great Dinosaur based on Grandpa Longneck. It's a super wholesome message that greatly elevates the overall movie. Oh, and lastly, I do enjoy the songs in this one. In my opinion, none of them are complete standouts, but they're each good and very enjoyable. That's about it on this one. To me, Secret of Source Rock is fine, it's serviceable. While there are some parts I really like, and nothing outright terrible, I would say too much emphasis goes to the mediocre points, leaving this entry a little more forgettable than the others. If more focus was given to the great parts rather than the parts that were just eh, then this could have been a top tier for me. When I sat down to rewatch number 7, The Stone of Cold Fire, my fear was that it wouldn't live up to the memories I had of it as a kid. I've always considered it my favorite, so there was a huge possibility that it wouldn't live up to the hype, that my rose-hitted glasses would shatter on the floor. All of us probably have something from our childhoods we adored, only to realize later on, yeah, it sucks now. I will stop being so polite. Get the f out of my sight before I demolish you. Coming out of the Stone of Cold Fire, it not only lived up to my expectations, but far exceeded them. I was honestly surprised at how much I enjoyed it. Not only as a fun nostalgia trip that, yeah, this isn't something I'd love if I didn't grow up with it. No. In my opinion, this is a legitimately great film that anyone can watch. The filmmakers went so hard to craft the ultimate entry. I don't get it. Why? Out of all the big budget, hyped up theatrical releases, why was so much sauce put into this? The sixth straight to video sequel in a series that began 12 years earlier? Nobody had to try. Anything could have been thrown together for six year olds who would have eaten it up anyways. But for whatever reason, the filmmakers tried. They gave this their all. So much greatness was put into this one. I mean, just look at the cast. The epic Jim Cummings lends his voice to Sierra, the more villainous Ciara Dactylus henchman. 
Rob Paulson is once again given a villain role as the goofier Ramphorinkus named Rinkus. Bro, they got Michael York to play the antagonist here, Petrie's Uncle Toronto. Michael Shrekking York. How on earth did Universal pull together an all-star cast for this pointless, straight-to-video sequel? I don't know, but I'm glad they did. Alright, let me not get ahead of myself. The seventh installment starts with Littlefoot waking up one night to find a shooting star. He could really use a wish right now, wish right now. Later, when the adults are discussing this, the greatest song is dropped, we'll talk about it soon, and Uncle Toronto, who is overhearing the conversation, is convinced of its magic. Desiring to harness its power, Toronto manipulates Petrie into getting its location from Littlefoot. Before flying off, Ducky overhears the pterosaur posse, so they nab her before she can warn anyone. Thus begins a quest to rescue Ducky and learn the secrets of the space rock. Also, the friends are watched and spurred on by two strange rainbow faces. Yeah, um, so they turn out to be aliens who took dinosaur form to observe life on Earth. Upon seeing the commotion caused by the meteorite, they took it upon themselves to broaden the dinosaurs' minds, to ask more questions, become more curious about the world and its mysteries. Going into space! Mathematics! Quantum mechanics! The secrets of the universe! After some battles with Rinkus and Sierra, as well as Toronto, who seriously doesn't want to cause trouble with anyone, the friend group makes it to the impact location, Three Horn Peak. Lo and behold, the Stone of Cold Fire had no magic, but it's great that Littlefoot and friends still ventured out of the status quo to make this discovery. Alright, I've been dancing around this forever. Uncle Toronto is definitely my favorite villain of the series so far, and the stellar voice work is only a part of it. Unlike nearly all previous entries, Toronto isn't a sharp tooth who just wants to eat the kids. That's been done so many times at this point, so not once does anyone ever try to eat them. Instead, his goal is to find the crash site of the meteorite and harness its power to become a great leader. Okay, hold up. Becoming powerful or omnipotent or whatever is a lame villain motivation that's been done to death. I can't count how many bland villains I've seen who just want to rule the world or some crap. Toronto? Toronto's different. Us audiences really get to see into this guy's head to find that he has the most noble intentions. He truly believes in his cause, but all too often, he becomes so blinded by his goal that he ends up making bad decisions. The motivation here is really strong. Ever since the dinosaur herds came together to find the Great Valley, they functioned as a direct democracy. Every adult votes on decisions, with no voice being more important than others, though it seems like Littlefoot's grandparents and Sarah's dad hold much influence. In a system where everyone gets a say in decisions, it takes too long. The herds are often too indecisive, wasting valuable time bickering with one another. We've seen this so many times before in the series. There's usually some gathering where the grown-ups stand around arguing, prompting Mr. Threehorn to throw the wildest remarks and causing the kids to go settle things for themselves. It's an inefficient way to get things done. That's where Toronto comes in. He believes the Great Valley would be in much better shape under a strong autocracy. Rather than wasting time fighting, he would take charge, leading everyone to greatness. Why him? Well, he's a flyer. Again, flight is such a coveted, overpowered ability. Flyers can avoid most of the dangers and obstacles throughout the world. Petrie has the easiest time of anybody crossing difficult barriers. Also, being able to soar high into the air, they're given a point of view only dreamt of by the others. Toronto believes this sight of his makes him superior and a natural born leader. It's his duty, no, his divine right to lead. It all seems to be sincere too. He's not just manipulating others, though he will gladly do that to accomplish his goals. Toronto truly believes that he was destined to lead. All this happened before, during the events of the first film too. You get a flashback to the herbivores unsure of the path to the Great Valley, so Toronto went off with a faction of his own, sure that he knew the way, that he was better than everyone else. In a terrible turn of events, these wanderers ended up in a sharp toothed ambush with their guide as the only survivor. But no more. With the powers granted by the space rock, this Pteranodon will finally become the leader he was destined to be. Unfortunately for him, it's just a simple rock. Even without these powers, he still wants to be a good person, never repeating the horrors of the past. 
We get this in one scene after Threehorn Peak erupts, tossing Ducky over the edge. This reminds our antagonist of the dinosaurs he lost before and gives him a chance to redeem himself. Not only that, but the writers continue to explore the theme of democracy versus autocracy or some other form of absolute rule. Yes, direct democracies or democratic representative republics in our modern world may take ages to solve a problem. They may result in constant back and forth. Tensions may rise between members. All true. However, by taking time to think things through, they're able to make well-informed decisions, sometimes. Toronto can act swiftly on his own accord, though his snap judgments, more often than not, lead to unforeseen consequences, causing more problems for him. And although there's the illusion of being in charge, when one person wields all the power, others will constantly covet that power. Throughout the film's progression, Sierra and Rinkus repeatedly try to usurp Toronto's position. A dictator will always have a target on their back. Once he finally approaches the stone to no avail, Toronto has to accept how average he is. He sees his mediocre mortality. Flyers aren't destined for greatness, they're just as flawed as everyone else and capable of the same shortcomings. There's no divine right to rule, just average people longing for power. Know your f***ing place, trash! Then, to rub even more salt in the wound, in the resolution after Toronto's been tried by the Valley members, he's given a relative slap on the wrist of only six years of banishment. After aiding the kidnapping of Ducky, plus several accounts of child endangerment, he's punished lightly. The very system Toronto tried to overthrow ends up saving him in the end. Ah, <sighs> I love it. The filmmakers went so hard into the themes and messaging. They did such a great job exploring these ideas, the pros and cons of both government systems, that you'd think I'm making this up. There's no way a Land Before Time movie would bother. But they did. Oh, they did. When exploring an idea, it's not enough to simply say, my side good, your side bad. Doing this is boring, lazy, and intellectually dishonest. You have to give both sides their due. Play devil's advocate with yourself. Then, in the end, if your side still comes out on top, you know you have a worthwhile idea. This is brilliantly done in The Land Before Time 7. And this leaves Toronto as not only the best villain of the series by a mile, but as my favorite character. There's a common saying that every villain is the hero of their own story, and I think nobody embodies that better than Toronto. He's not evil, he has no ill intentions, but his philosophy is flawed. His methods put himself and those around him in danger, making him the antagonist. Yet another very mature theme is good versus evil. No, not the typical good guys being the bad guys, that's done in like 90% of movies ever. Rather, we learn about how people don't fall into neat categories of good or bad. Nobody is born to be just all good or all bad. Instead, everybody does both good and bad things in their lifetime, though some may sway more towards one side or the other. Take Abraham Lincoln, for example, one of the most revered figures in American history. He was president during the U.S. Civil War, fighting to reunite the country while also working to abolish slavery, knowing this to be the true and very obvious cause of the war. In 1863, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation that made the Union Army free slaves in captured rebel territories. Then, in 1865, he was finally able to get his 13th Amendment passed that permanently ended slavery in the United States. Awesome. Was he a brave abolitionist? Eventually he got to that point, so yeah. Did he make 40 level chess plays throughout the war? Definitely. Did he also suspend the writ of habeas corpus and imprison citizens solely for criticizing the war? Oh, yeah. Here, this is well explored with Uncle Toronto. Technically, he's the antagonist being at odds with our leads, but he isn't a bad guy. He just has bad judgment while trying to accomplish well-intended goals. During the adventure, while out in the mysterious beyond, Ducky and Petrie sing a song about this in Good Inside. It's a pretty nice song with a deeper message than most kids films have to offer. Is having an entire song explaining this too on the nose? Sure, but it's still a very worthwhile message. 
Now, this brings us to the songs, and I've got to say, this entry does not disappoint. I just discussed Good Inside, but Toronto Song, a very important creature. It's another decent one musically, though it does offer us some more insights into what he's all about, so I'm glad it's here. Then, of course, I'd be an idiot not to mention the best song, not only in this movie, not only in this series, but in all of humanity. Thousands upon thousands of years of human civilization and art all reached their peak with Beyond the Mysterious Beyond. 40,000 years of evolution and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. Okay, am I exaggerating a bit? Sure. But this easily dominates as the most epic song The Land Before Time has to offer, as the rainbow faces sing about the mysteries of the universe, how we need to expand our worldview to recognize how we don't even know what we don't know. This song hits so, so hard. Man, I've been raving about this movie for so long, but I still have one more compliment to give. Usually, Petrie doesn't contribute much aside from forced comedic relief moments, so I'm glad to see him get much more to do here. As I mentioned when reviewing the original, he is prideful in his ability to fly, a clear advantage the others don't have. This, along with the fondness for his uncle, leads to him being conflicted over who to trust and what to believe. Being more open to Toronto makes him an easy target for manipulation. I don't know, I like getting more insight into the more peripheral characters, something we'll see continue in 8. Bringing this film to a close, The Stone of Cold Fire is an unironic masterpiece, being the most underappreciated animated movie of all time. Step aside, Iron Giant, this one deserves more love. If you haven't caught on by now, I call The Stone of Cold Fire the very best installment in the Land Before Time series. I was floored at how great it was on a rewatch. The Land Before Time 7 is a tough act to follow, but Charles Grosvenor gave us the big freeze in 2001. While having the worst Christmas in our lives, many kids found this under their tree. Gee, thanks. Returning to this entry, the most striking feature is the upgraded animation. A heavy focus is placed on lighting and shading, adding more depth to the previously flatter style. Not bad before, though certainly improved here. Characters are more expressive, while their movements feel more fluid. Gotta be honest though, there were some odd moments where characters were inexplicably different colors than usual. Yeah, it's common in these movies for characters to look different at night, you know, to represent the darkness over them, but at points it feels like the animators dropped random colors on them just cause. Going into the big freeze, I was excited to see Spike take more of a leading role. He usually doesn't get much to do that makes him stand out. And I've mentioned before how I'd like to learn more about him. Why doesn't he talk? Why does he act the way he does? How does he feel about being adopted? What happened to his biological parents? This entry answers some of these questions and not very well at that. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. What's this one about? Plot-wise, there's a lot going on here with multiple threads that tie together over time. One point being that a herd of Stegosaurus arrives to eat everyone's food in the Great Valley, bringing along another young one named Tippy. Yeah, he won't be mentioned much. Despite being prominently featured on covers and promotional material, Tippy gets less to do than Dinah and Dana. Really, his only role is to play with Spike. That's it. That's his whole characterization. He likes playing. Cool. Awesome. Great. I'm sure I'll remember you in five minutes after watching this. Okay, so at the same time, Ducky gets mad at Spike for keeping her awake at night with his snoring and eating her food. Her anger pushes Spike away and into the arms of the welcoming Spike Tails, or so I guess. He seems either entirely oblivious to her anger or he just doesn't care. There's no scene in which we see this affect Spike. So eventually, it's agreed that Tippy's mom will look after Spike as they move on from the Great Valley, devastating Ducky. Wait, that's the big disagreement that pushes Spike away? He snores too loudly and eats a lot? This is all par for the course with Spike. Ducky's seriously gonna lose her brother over this? I mean, I know it's a kid's movie, it ain't like Spike will be murdering people or anything. Still though, this is the best they can come up with? Also, there's snow that starts falling and also also, Apparently, the prehistoric pals have a teacher, a Pachyrhinosaurus named Mr. Thicknose. Mr. Thicknose? I'd much rather have Miss Thick- <laughs> To the film's credit, they keep hitting us with all these awesome prehistoric animals. 
Well done here. Hey, look, they actually gave Pachyvinosaurus a boss, unlike some programs. I travel in worlds you can't even imagine. You can't conceive of what I'm capable of. I'm so far beyond you. Mr. Thicknose, as the wise old elder of the valley, who we've never seen until now, even though his input would have been useful many times, he's supposed to know everything. So the fact that it snows causes the rest of the dinosaurs to stop trusting him. Come on, really? He's ostracized because he couldn't predict snow? So that's never reached a great valley before? It ain't like they have 20th century weather tracking technology. How the swamp was he supposed to know? It's getting to the point where the series dinos act like the citizens of Bikini Bottom, who are always irrational and ready to say the most unhinged things. Unlike Spongebob, which plays us up for comedy, we're actually supposed to be taking these moments seriously here since they have major consequences on the plot and characters. Later on is when these threads start getting connected together. Ducky follows the Stegosaurus herd into the frozen wasteland so she can bring back Spike. The rest of the kids want to follow her naturally, but aren't allowed to go without supervision from Mr. Thicknose, so he tags along to guide them, though he proves to be not as wise as he claims, never having left his home before. I'm smelling some continuity problems in the air. Sure, we've heard of dinosaurs already having lived in the Great Valley before, but seriously, this guy never left? Where did he go during the giant raging fire in 3, or after the locust ate everything in 5? I'm not buying it. Eventually, they take down a sharp tooth and reunite with Ducky who has yet to find Spike. A hot spring is found with enough food and water for everyone, the Albertosaurus is defeated again, and then the rest of the herbivores are told about the food. But where there's food, there's Spike who sniffs it out meeting back with everyone again and staying with his real family. After some time, the snow melts, leaving everything back to normal again. Alright, so I interrupted myself with a few points before. Continuing off of that, this installment, aside from the animation, I found mediocre. Spike finally gets his time to shine, but it feels underwhelming. His conflict with Ducky feels too forced. Using social studies terms, the push factors from the swimmers are poorly explained. Again, Ducky being mad at him isn't given the attention the way it needs. I can't tell if this affects Spike at all. Maybe he feels left out. We see one scene where he can't swim with the others, even though they're just relaxing in shallow water, which he's definitely played in before. The pull factors towards the Spike tails are just as weak, maybe weaker. He likes playing with Tippy, and they tend to eat a lot. That's all we get. If you want to tell a story like this, then give us clear reasons as to why Spike would leave the family he's had since hatching. What are his wants? What does he feel he's missing in life? Us audiences don't get that. Oh, plus the inclusion of Tippy shows that, hey, Stegosaurus children can act like normal kids. So does Spike have special needs then? Why not focus more on that? If Spike is autistic and or nonverbal, that would be a lovely subject for a kids film to tackle. Children who don't know what this is can learn. They can see what life is like for a person with these disabilities and what their relatives have to go through. This would have made for a much better movie. <sighs> I have to review the movie we got, not the movie I wanted. In other news, the songs were... eh. Like several others in the series, it seems like a lot of effort went into one while the other two were left, kinda. Eh. Family, sung by Ducky and her mother, is the clear winner. The Mad Song, where Sarah teaches Ducky how to be mad, along with the lesson between Mr. Thicknose and the gang, both feel more like characters having discussions through singing rather than genuine songs. This results in lots of sing-talking and lines which aren't catchy or memorable, but are just there to progress the conversation. When evading these, I consider which ones I'd care to listen to on my own time. Why would I ever bother listening to the lesson outside of this movie? Especially when I have big water already. Lastly, The Big Freeze delivers a message on how people want to be appreciated. You know, Mr. Thicknose is being an old man who wants some place in the world to the point where he started embellishing his experiences. People want to be heard and appreciated. I can't tell if this supposedly applies to Spike as well, but I must comment again how it feels forced. Now, time to rate this one. The Big Freeze should be commended for its animation upgrade, along with its willingness to give Spike the spotlight. However, the execution falls flat for me. I wasn't sold on the conflicts between characters or their motivations. 
And hopefully Spike gets more prominently featured in a future installment, cause this one did not do him justice. Not as bad as 4, but definitely not up with any of the others. Very mediocre in my opinion. Mediocre? Oof, that's enough for now. I had so much to say on these four, so I'll save Journey to Big Water for next time, along with the Great Long Neck Migration and Invasion of the Tiny Sauruses. Definitely hold on to your butts. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.